lo and behold, when the first labs come out, that was Steep Hill was first, then Pure Analytics. Pure Analytics comes out, Samantha Mill is a brilliant scientist. So I meet her and she says, hey, I can do predicative work. And I'm like, nice, let's look into predicative work and find out what's going on. We start to take a look at what's taking place with Lawrence's work and what, what we're doing with the canatonic line. And we start pulling out the outliers that let us breed these lines to get a greater stability. Lawrence ends up passing away from can uh, cancer. He gives me his whole collection. I then diffuse it into the cannabis community so that it's in the hands of individuals. And I put on all these programs on how to cultivate. And then I put them in touch with extractors that had the ability to do medical extraction so that, that all these patients would be self-sustaining. I, 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 I wasn't a, a medical guy prior. I'm, I'm a historic black market cultivator, technician, trafficker. And so I take over a dispensary 11 years ago and I get humanized from the experience because I see real need for medical stuff. And I'm like, well, these people are absolutely dying. And it tripped me out because I'd never been around people that were dying before. I see people die from gunshots and I see you, not slow death. Not slow death and I did not know what it looked like and I didn't realize that you could replace so much medicine from cannabis. Thank you. And so I went on this run, so I, I'm involved in the foundation of modern CBD and I say, hey, this is gonna be awesome. And then lo and behold, uh, they start to mine Kentucky hemp, Chinese hemp, because people say, hey, we can just use this and it works. And it does work to a degree, but the efficiency isn't the same and the, the overall spectrum of benefits isn't the same because you're not receiving. They want to give you CBD alone, but CBD has to have some THC present in order to be optimized for uptake. Yeah, because the way the receptors release and recover it, you get a longer recovery rate, longer cycle rate in the body if we have THC present. Okay, what's the, uh, like, hemp just has no THC at all in it? Below 0.3. But it's not that it doesn't have any THC present. It's just that hemp wasn't selected for smoking purposes. Oh, sorry. Hemp wasn't selected for smoking purposes, fiber purposes only. And so what I realized as just this revelation was that none of us smoke land race cannabis. As much as people think it's land race, it's not. They took land race populations and they chose the plants they wanted to use for their patches, propagated it, cultivated it, and then they kept the males they wanted to pollinate the, the seed for next year into the females they wanted to use for next year. As soon as man touches that shit, it's a cultivated variety. Land race is naturally occurring. So what they could do in Afghanistan, Africa, is they could go Tibet, is they could go into land race populations and find the outliers that lived through the drought that year, lived through the locust. The ones that lived through the locust, they could then add to the geological population. The ones that survived this new pathogenic issue, add it to the genealogical population. So I get the genealogical information present. But fundamentally, that cannabis was used as medicine. And it was used in CBD form. If you're equatorial, and, I, and just because I got to see so much data, I started going, I got you. Everything that we consider psychoactive on spiritual use, stuff we want, heady weed, that all comes from zero to 20 on the equator. That's where people had incredible lifestyle, where you had plenty of water, you didn't have to worry about uh, freezing to death in the winter. It wasn't over 90 degrees, because it's never that hot on the equator, because I used to work on the equator. So it's not that hot, it's just incredible sun intensity. And then you start to get above 20 to 40, and it's in the 30s that we're talking Afghanistan, Pakistan, where you have some of the most savage weather known to mankind, and no water. And so I started realizing that it breaks down really pretty well where the easier your life was is where you cultivated spiritual cerebral cannabis. And the more you moved away from the zero towards the 40, where basically it, it, it ended all normal cannabis production, you started having CBD dominant cannabis or one-to-one -one ratio and cannabis. And nature? nope, not hardier, better for you to consume. Hardier in a sense that it works in that environment but not hardier if you bring it down to the equator okay. because it has to have an ability to work with all, all stuff we're talking about over the 30 and that or range is high desert. Yeah, because high desert is, is considered uh, in a definition less than 10 inches of rain a year. So I need to have a different type of root system and I need to have a different type of leaf structure to be a more efficient radiator. And I have to have an ability to control desiccation more so higher trichome levels because trikes really do help desiccation the drying out of the flower. And then lo and behold, how do you hold flour in Morocco? You can't. 
And so when I started getting into hash making, probably like, let me see, that would have been around same 99, 2000, I started doing all my water process back then. I had a lady who had lived in Morocco for about four years. And she was showing us what we, she was, what we were doing. She goes, you guys are not letting this shit dry out enough. She said, you have to take it to zero. And so I started coming up with my own drying systems in pizza boxes. And then I used big commercial coffee grinders to do the microplaning. So when me and Brandon hook up from third gen, he was dying because I was using coffee grinders to microplane 15 years ago. But what it did was it let me make really high quality bubble. And we had access to truckloads of shake at the time coming out of all the huge massive indoors. So it was a waste product. So I had all these massive operations where we would run all the, the ice water hash through the systems and then run it through the filtration. And then we would dry it in the pizza racks in the house and then micro it and then run it through dye presses that I had welders whip up for me. And then once the material, once they got tired of that varietal, I would just repress it in new dye. So I would throw it in a brand new dye, repress it again, and it would come out as a brand new product as far as the store was concerned. They'd be like, oh my God, that's a much better product. Same product in another form. It's kind of like the turkey bag phenomenon. Yeah. You bring it to them in one turkey bag, they don't want it. You go back in the house, bring it back in another turkey bag, yeah, they'll take it. They'll take it. Not exactly, they'll take it. They don't know the difference. And we know that. And so we were delivering really high quality product, but you start to see the nuances of perception. But the point was, she was telling me that they have tins, the way they tin up the, the hash in Morocco, where they're holding it for years with no mold, no, no holdability. So I started realizing, I got you. It's because the flour degrades so quickly in these very low humidity environments that they can't hold flour. And that's why hash production was valuable for these individuals. But if you were to look at the hash from any of those countries, it would have a way more balanced chemotype. You'd see a much more uh, dominant CBD ratio. So not disproportionate, but more like a one to one or a one to 0.5. So when I started getting all the Pakistani genetics getting shipped in from the Pakistani hash fields, the first thing I did was propped it all up and then sent it to the lab. So I could start to take a look at it on predicative. And then it let me understand what was inside. And that's when I started realizing this hypothesis. I started being able to put together a lifetime of doing this and saying, whoa, the data says this, which makes sense for what we think. Therefore, that's what it is. So I know that with all these varietals that came through, all the original Afghanis, if you run all those originals, they're like 9%. You got low numbers, man. We skewed them. And then, unfortunately, the storefronts are obsessed with numerics and it completely screws up the reality of cannabis. Yeah. Yeah. It screws it up. It seems like it's leveling back out. It, it, the, as the fruits come in. The yeah. fruits are coming in because, yeah. well, that's, that's, and well, that's, but that's terp levels now. So now it's skewed terp levels. Yeah. And I have stuff that's 2.6 on a total terp that's ungodly quality that you would say it has five times the terp levels of a 5% because the numbers don't quantify it. It's like saying, you know, I always use, yeah, you're pretty, but you're not a nice person. So yeah, you can add 100 pretty points and you keep adding pretty points, keep adding them, keep adding them. It doesn't change the fact that you suck to be around, so I'm good, just get the fuck out of the car. And, and that's how it is to me with cannabis where no, there's no reality. And it, it, it's the only way to perceive this stuff in, in real life is to understand that there's things that you can use in context to understand where we're going wrong with what we're doing now. And, and as the reality comes in and people become more educated, it'll be a lot easier. And that's why when I get to mess around with Abrams where at first, you know, they were aggressive when this, just like the wine industry, I get all these top wine execs come in and they attack me on judging, judging weed because they go, we want to take over the industry and how sommeliers run it. And I said, the key difference between you and I, my friend, is that you're judging flavonoids and ethyl alcohol. So no matter what alcohol you're playing with, it's the same basic booze, ethyl alcohol. You're, you can put it in your mouth and spit it out. You can't spit out the cannabinoids, and it's in the cannabinoids that the effect is, is dominated by, so you have to be able to. So eventually it traumatized them because they said, you basically have to be a career weed smoker yeah. to be able to do it. And I said, yeah, because I have... Yeah, because I'm going to be able to smoke 40 varieties and tell you that was the one that worked. Yeah. And, and, and so when I hang out with normal individuals, they're like, you're a drug addict because they watch me smoke so much. I'm like, no, I'm not a drug addict. It's just that I can function normally on high levels of intoxication and I can discern this was the one that worked. And if you put them all back in the cookie jar, I'll still pull the same one out over and over again because that's what we do for a living. It's not me, it's other people like me. If you're a career, you're a career. And the wine guys finally were like, all right, all right. So then we had a better relationship because they weren't being so adversarial. 
because they're very intelligent and most of them are PhD scientists and, and viticulturalists and sommelier and sort of them, they're like the top of the food chain and how things are perceived. But I can smoke with them some reefer and they're on the hands and knees begging for me to take them home so yeah, I can put them on in, in, into a cot. So I'm, ju I'm just like, you ain't judging anything, buddy. <laughs> so we, we know that to be true. And you, and you need to be able to say, hey, these are the things that happen and the public um, is the same way. So when I get academics to come in, each individual that comes into cannabis wants to disprove what you do. And because you're not one of their peers, you must not be as sharp. And so therefore, a lifetime of doing this at every level humanly possible doesn't mean anything. We know this from this. And what they find out is that they're mistaken. And then you end up building a relationship so now you can actually share. Because I don't pretend to be a scientist, I'm not. I am fascinated with science and I use scientists, but I'm a field operator. That's what I'm about. I'm about getting product to the table. And I'm about helping farmers get product to the table.